What is up my YouTube family? Welcome back to my channel. If this is your first time here, then it's just welcome to my channel. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed. Now I know some of y'all a little mad at me. Y'all a little mad at me if you follow me on Instagram because I did make a post saying that I will be back Tuesday. And uh, it's Thursday and this is my first video back. The reason is, y'all, I filmed this video and my face was so bloated. Like, look at this. This is insane. When I sat down to edit, I was like, oh no, baby. I can't let this be how they see me on my first day back. Like my first day out, I just can't. And at first I was gonna go ahead and just edit and put it out. And I was like, they'll see me Thursday and they'll see the difference. And I'll just look crazy on Tuesday. But child, I sat down and edit the video like two to three times, three times. And I was just like, nah. Cut the cameras. Dada. Y'all like my new wig? If you like the hair, I'll put the details in the description box below. Also, before I get started, I do want to let you know because so many people ask this. I now have a P.O. box and I do it like this because technically it's not a P.O. box, but it operates the exact same except, I don't know if you know, but a P.O. box, only the postal service can use that girl. I need everybody to be able to send me stuff. FedEx, UPS, buy them pigeon with a string on his ankle bro i need everybody to be able to reach me via whatever carrier and so i have a ups box the address is in the description box below it's also in the bio of my social media and so if you want to send me anything you can and without further ado let's just get into the video we'll get into my business at the end y'all today's story is a hot ass mess i'm gonna just go ahead and tell you that off the rip before i get started this is the thing you know i like to tell y'all about things that i find that i truly honestly and dearly adore and the product that i'm talking about is a face mask by lush it is called the cup of coffee face and body mask and uh, a little bit goes a long way it is not that expensive and the thing about the price i have used so many face masks many of which have been upwards of 56 dollars and on up a little bit more i've also tried ones that were not as expensive and those ones i see more of a difference the clay mask by youth to the people that is like the only mask that i've used that was like on the higher end that i really saw a difference in my skin like that i really genuinely like but this one works best of all and it's the cheapest of them all. I know I didn't pay over $30 for this, and this is a lot of product. A little bit goes a long way, even with me, because you know I like to slather my face like a bagel child. I've barely put a dent in it, and I use it all the time. I will link it down below if you are interested. I highly recommend it. I love it so much. It's one of my favorite face masks, and Melissa recommended it to me. She told me about this mask so long ago, and I'm just like, girl, whatever, because she just was like, you put it on, and after you use it, you just... You just feel so radiant and your skin is so bright and you just feel so beautiful and you're just glowing and I'm like, girl, okay, whatever. But uh, I stopped by Lush and picked one up. This is one night. So on January 13th of 2010, 16-year-old twins return home from school and they find that their 34-year-old mother Nikki Whitehead have been viciously attacked inside of their home. The house is a mess. There are things thrown all around. So they call the police right away. And the investigators, they waste no time at all trying to put the pieces together to figure out who had done this to Nikki and why. Now the crime scene itself, it gave intruder tees like as if someone had broken in. Maybe they did not expect her to be at home and when they see her or when she finds them, a struggle ensues. One in which she of course does not win. But the crime itself gave crime of passion. Considering how badly she had been hurt and beaten, it was quite obvious that the person that had done this was somebody who knew her personally and had an emotional tie to her of some sort. Nikki had been badly beaten. She had been stabbed over 80 times. A crime like that, that is considered overkill, is not typical of one that is random, where the victim does not know the perpetrator. They knew that this was somebody that knew her personally. Of course, they first began speaking with the daughters because they're the ones that called the police and they are the ones that are already there at the scene. They asked the twins if they knew of anybody that would do such a thing to their mother, anybody that she may have had an issue with, a fight with recently, any anything of that nature. And the girls are like, we don't know who could have done this at all. Now, the police didn't think that this was odd because, you know, typically you don't put kids in grown folks' business. So they felt like this could have been somebody who she had an issue with that the twins were just not aware of. So from there, they go and they question the boyfriend and they question also a couple of close friends and relatives to Nikki just to see if they knew anything. If Nikki had a personal beef with somebody of some sort, of course somebody 
within her circle would have known something about it. But again, they come up empty because according to her close friends and her family and according to her boyfriend, they don't know of anybody who would want to do something so heinous. She pretty much had no known enemies, so they were not getting anywhere with that. Now, with this being the case, they decide to alter their line of questioning and instead try to get a good picture of who she was as a person to help better understand how they may have gotten there today. From talking to her friends and family, they gather that life for Nikki was not always just, you know, a walk in the park. It actually started off very rough. She was born in a prison. Her mother was in jail at the time of her birth, leaving Nikki to be raised by her grandmother, Della. Now, Della, she tried her best. She provided all of the things that Nikki needed in life. But the one thing that she didn't provide Nikki that she probably needed more of was discipline. Della was very lenient when it came to her granddaughter. This resulted in Nikki being a little bit of a rebellious teen child. She was getting into all of the things, all of the trouble. Nothing too crazy, but like your typical bad teenage behavior, the staying out late, the being with the boys, and all of the things like that. Well, at 17, Nikki finds out that she is pregnant, and she ain't pregnant with just one little baby child. She is pregnant with twin girls, two babies, a two for one. Now, her grandmother Della agrees to continue to support her and also help her out with her twin girls if she agreed to stay focused in school and focused on her children. Like, all you have to do is graduate. You have to be a present parent and I will help you raise them. Now, this is the agreement that they come up with and it remains the agreement until the twins are about 12 years old. Now, at this time, Nikki meets a 55-year-old truck driver whom she begins dating and after some time, she decides that, you know, it's time for, well, they decide together that it's time for them to take their relationship to the next level. He offers for her to move with her girls to Conyers, Georgia and be with him. He would provide a home for them, shelter, you know, he'd be the man of the house doing all of the things. She could then pursue her dreams. So she goes to Georgia, enrolls in school to pursue a degree in fashion design. In the meantime, she is working as a beautician to earn money of her own. She had always envisioned the kind of lifestyle that she would have liked to have been able to provide for her daughters. And this afforded her the opportunity to provide them some of those experiences. So she was extremely excited about this. This made her extremely happy. She enrolls the girls in dance classes. They were in music classes. The girls were Girl Scouts and whatever talents and hobbies they display and interest in, she is more than happy and more than willing to nurture. Especially because the girls were always good kids. Like they were always really good kids. They never gave her any problems. And so she felt like they, of course, deserved the world and she was more than willing to give as much of it to them as she possibly could. The girls had straight A's. They were very well behaved and they both had dreams of attending Harvard after high school. But child, once they got to high school, is when the BS started. Nikki did not know why, but suddenly she began to see a shift in the girl's behavior. They began to clash with her and it started like with little disagreements, little smart remarks that they would throw out there in regards to some things that she would say or things that she told them they could not do. There were a lot of things and certain freedoms that they felt like they were entitled to that Nikki did not agree with. And they felt like her boundaries were very hypocritical considering the fact that she grew up in Della's household and Della didn't have all these rules. Della did not have a tight leash on her and all of the things that she had done as a teen they felt like you should have a little bit more understanding for us like you should be a little more free with us they were pretty much like girl you was out doing all of the things why can't we at least do some of them it's not fair now Nikki had also made herself a couple of little friends child so she was out having a good time enjoying life which she if you think about it was a teen mom so she really didn't get the opportunity to do a whole lot of that because she had not one but two babies and had to finish school and I'm sure work and provide for them after high school and so now that she was an adult and she was more stable she was trying to enjoy her life a little bit and catch up on some of the time that she had lost in her you know young adulthood the twins also felt like because of this she was yet again being a hypocrite now Nikki felt like she wanted better for her kids she was like you know what I wish I had somebody who put their foot down and maybe I wouldn't have made a lot of the mistakes that I made and I'm trying to keep y'all from making the same mistakes furthermore I'm grown so I do what I want to do she refused to provide them more freedom and because of this their resentment toward their mother 
it just continues to grow. As the twins are getting older, their relationship with one another is intensifying. They are growing increasingly close. Their bond is extremely strong. However, in the same token, their relationship with their mother is becoming increasingly strained. They got to a point where they were pretty much tired of asking her permission to do certain things. And so instead, they would work to find different loopholes, more ways to undermine her and break the rules that she has set for them. And y'all, you notice that two heads are better than one. So they were really out here working double time to break all of the rules and get around all of the things that Nikki told them that they should not and could not do. Nikki was very quickly reaching her wits end dealing with these two girls. Like she was becoming very much fed up with all of it. Now I ain't raised them too nature but I heard it's enough work dealing with one. I can't imagine that one bad ass team having a copy and paste running around like a whole sidekick. Nikki began to feel like she was losing control and she didn't know what else to do. Her boyfriend, he did try to help her out with them. He is 60 though at the time. And the thing is, these aren't really his kids. He did try to talk to them. They didn't treat him the same way they treated Nikki. They had little to no respect for their mother, but they would listen to him somewhat. And he would try to talk to them, you know, to make them act right and try to talk some sense into them, but it never changed anything. They would continue to do all of the things that they wanted to do instead. Things had actually become so bad and so hostile between Nikki and her daughters that on several occasions she was forced to call the police to come out and de-escalate the situation because not only were they talking back and yelling and being disrespectful, they had begun to put their hands on her. Their disagreements would now become physical. In one instance, Nikki calls the police and when the officer comes out to the house, she speaks to the twins and they are very calm and they tell her that they can no longer live there like it's a wrap like it's just too much as if they ain't the ones causing all the chaos girl it's just too much i can't live here anymore like we have to go live with our grandmother now one thing that the officer noted is the fact that the twins seemed so so sweet their demeanor and their energy was just so calm they came off very innocent yet the look on nikki's face was as if she was terrified of them. Like she looked at them with such fear in her eyes that the officer just felt like that was just strange. Now, hours later, that exact same police officer who was still on duty patrolling, she decides that she's just gonna, you know, cruise on by the house just to make sure she don't see anything going on, child, that the house ain't rocking, shaking and tumbling down. The girls ain't in there throwing hands and feet. And sure enough, just as she had suspected, when she gets close to the house, she can hear them screaming from the inside. When she approaches the door to investigate or to, you know, intervene in the madness, she can see the two angelic looking sweet twins from earlier who are full on fighting this lady in her house. She places both of their asses under arrest immediately and takes them down to the station. Ultimately, this doesn't result in anything more than them just having a couple of juvenile court appearances and them being ordered to go to family counseling with their mother. When they're released from juvenile, they're actually released into the custody of the grandmother in order to stay with her until, you know, at least things de-escalate, which they were extremely happy about because they did not want to go to their mother's house anyway. They wanted to be with Della because they felt like Della was a lot more lenient and she would give them the freedom that they needed to survive. Now, Miss Della welcomes them into her home because she is more than willing to, you know, intervene and try to do something to help the situation be more comfortable for her granddaughter and her great granddaughters and so she allows them to stay but it's not long before she gets to see firsthand all of the things that they were making nikki suffer through they continued all of the antics the disrespect they had actually started stealing from this lady she had to lock her bedroom door to keep them out and keep them out of her things because they will go in and take things like they were theirs. The great grandmother puts up with it for as long as she possibly can before she tells them, you know what? I've had enough. You have to go back to live with your mother. And Nikki did not want her grandmother over there dealing with her twin girl. She felt like if anybody needed to be dealing with them and raising them, it was her. So in late December of 2009, the twins are returned to their mother's home against their will. They do not want to be there. Child, she takes them back kicking and screaming. They can no longer stay with Della because they were just doing too damn much. Now they return home and of course they continue the same antics. The same old abusive, aggressive behaviors that 
had what going on before that landed them behind bars and down to their grandmother's house. And in the two weeks prior to Nikki being found deceased, she had actually called the police to her home on three separate occasions to de-escalate a situation where her daughters had gotten so aggressive and become physical with her. I'm telling you right now. I have two whole sisters, and if these were my twin children, baby, at some point, I'm going to have to call one of my sisters, okay? And it's just going to be us two against y'all two. We just going to have to square up. I'm so sorry about it. Throw hands and feet. I'm going to have to call Melissa, though, because she is short, and she is angry and hostile. She'll be down for whatever. See, my older sister, considering the fact that these are my kids, she'll want to show up and have us sit Indian style like Russell Simmons and the grass girl and have a whole kumbaya moment with the earth and all of the things. And no, baby, that's not what I called you over here. I called you to throw hands and feet, girl. She is very much a Leo, the Leoist of the Leos. And so if it was anybody else, she would be ready to throw hands, feet, rocks, and everything else. But considering these were my kids, that is definitely a Melissa job. So after all of these things come to light and they have put together the pieces that paint the actual dynamic between Nikki and her daughters, they call the girls into the interrogation room because they want to see if asked questions about her character, are they going to speak highly of her and act like there were not all of these issues? Or are they going to tell the truth about the tumultuous relationship between herself and the two of them? So it's pretty much the situation where somebody already know the answer, but they ask you anyway just to see if you're going to lie. That's what they did with the girls. They bring them in there. They ask them questions about Nikki's character. And the girls are honest to a degree. They do tell the officers that there were issues between her and them. They said that Nikki was this party animal who was rarely home, didn't want to really be a mother. And that was the issue that they had with her. And that's why they clashed a lot of the times and did not get along. They painted her as the party animal who always wanted to stay out late drinking and doing all of the things except being a mother. And because of this, their relationship with her was just so strained, but they loved their mother. During their questioning, something else had actually caught the investigators off guard and struck them as odd. Both girls were sitting inside of the room and had not taken off their coat nor their gloves. But it's not cold in the interrogation room. In fact, it's very much warm. And so it's like, girl, why y'all got all this on? Now at first, they're just like, you know, feel free to take your jacket off and your gloves. And the girls are like, oh no, that's okay, like we're good. They allow the girls to continue to talk for a little bit longer and they're just like they must be hiding something like this is not quite right so at this point they tell the girls to take them off instead of asking them if they would like to when they take off the gloves bite marks on both of their hands next they remove their jackets and there are more bite marks and scratches all over their arms. And when asked why they have these markings and where did they come from? They're like, oh, we had a disagreement and we fought each other. Like we did this to each other. We got into a whole fist fight, girl. Things got a little rough between us. Even more suspicious than that was their obvious lack of empathy for their mother. These investigators were very much seasoned. They had done this a lot and for a long time. And they had dealt with a lot of people who have lost loved ones. These girls did not have the characteristics of someone who had just found their mother the way that they had. And everybody grieves differently, yes, but something was just off about their demeanor. They had also left the girls alone in the interrogation room and continued to watch them. And when they do so, Taz, she begins to cry, but this cry just don't even seem right. Like it just seems very, very forced, very dry, the dry cry. She's like, I want my mommy. And then Jazz goes to console her and she's like, I know, but she's not coming back. So you have to be strong. And it just didn't sound or feel sincere at all. They actually have the footage from their Snap episode online. So if you Google them or you look them up on YouTube, you can actually find it. Meanwhile, while they're at the station, the investigators are still at the house looking over the crime scene and gathering clues to try to paint the picture of what might have happened here. Inside of Taz's room, they actually find this boot that had a balled up like paper towel inside, like all the way stuffed to the toe. And inside of the paper towel was a clump of hair. The boots are completely drenched in blood. They also go and pull the surveillance cameras from the school because according to them, when they first called the police, they left that morning 
normal time and went to school just like any other day typical day but the security footage shows the girls arriving at school midday they decided at this point to split the girls up and interrogate them separately but neither of the girls are breaking character. They are sticking to the story that they originally told. Investigators believed wholeheartedly that they were actually the ones that were responsible. But without having any hardcore evidence that proved this, they were forced to allow the girls to leave. They take photos of the bite marks and the scratches. They take DNA samples from the girls, but they're forced to ultimately let them go and they are released into the care and custody of Della. Baby, do you think I would have showed up to pick them girls up? No, ma'am. Took them bitches right around to the lost and found, baby, because I would have not wanted to have any parts of it. You cannot come to my house, child. Let them have called me from a number I didn't know. And I answered by accident. And they were like, yeah, Miss Vaughn, we have to, you know, release these girls. You can come pick them up. Child would have been like, okay, here I come. And never came. And if they showed up around my house with them two girls in the back seat, I would have treated them like people do who don't want to pass out candy on Halloween where they turn off their porch light, all the lights go and they get in bed and pretend like they're not there, that would have been me. But Della was a better woman than I. And so she picks up her granddaughters, takes them home, and they resume their life like nothing ever happened. Now the police, they patiently await the results of the DNA testing. They do investigate the boyfriend just to make sure he didn't have anything to do with this, but he is ultimately cleared of any suspicious activity. His alibi checked out, his DNA was not found at the crime scene like anywhere where it shouldn't have been. With Nikki being attacked the way that she was, they knew this was personal and if it was not the boyfriend, it had to be them damn kids. But they did not have any solid evidence that would solidify the case against the girls and so they pretty much just had to wait it out. But they always kept their eye on the girls. Finally, after four long months of waiting, they get the test results back and they have the evidence that they need in order to build a case, a solid case, where they felt like they could prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that they had done this to their own mother. Dental examinations of Nikki's teeth were matched perfectly to the bite marks found on the girl's hands. And not only that, the DNA extracted from underneath her fingernails matched their DNA perfectly. She had literally fought to her last breath and in doing so planted all of the evidence that would be needed to prove that they had done this to her. Now in addition to the DNA test, they had also found inside of the twins' room a journal that they used to write each other back and forth. Now why they felt like this was the smart or like secure thing to do maybe they didn't want to talk because they felt like somebody would hear them but girl you should have took your sister and talked to her in the bushes because writing it down is never a good idea child texting it is never a good idea in one of the entries one of them writes she's so selfish we have to get rid of her and the other twin responds by writing that's what i think also she gotta go asap with all of the evidence against the girls they are arrested immediately and taken to prison girl they weren't taken to juvenile this time they were taken to real big girl prison to await their trial date. No bond, no nothing. They just had to sit and wait. They are intentionally held separately because they, of course, don't want the girls to have the comfort of each other behind bars, girl, no. So they separate them and it takes four years for them to even get their trial date. The entire time that they are held behind bars, they both maintain their innocence. They did not do this to Nikki, that her real killer is still out there somewhere and it's a shame and ridiculous that they are focusing so much on her children who loved her and would have never done this. Now, because the girls are minors at the time of the crime, both of them would be able to avoid the death penalty but they were very much looking at a long, long time behind bars. It's like, girl, we may not be able to kill you, but we can keep you here for a really long time. We can keep you here till you die. And with all of the evidence mounted against them, child, it was not looking like they had any chance. Their legal counsel advises them that it's probably going to be a pretty ugly trial, child. This is probably going to get very ugly. Okay, so it's probably in your best interest to use a confession as a bargaining chip to get a lesser sentence and thus less time. The girls agree to confess in exchange for the opportunity to plead to a lesser crime, which would have been or which was voluntary manslaughter. Once they reach this agreement with the prosecution, the two of them sit down separately and finally tell the truth behind what happened on that day, at least the truth according to them. 
they claim that it began when Nikki woke up that morning and realized they had not gotten up for school. Both of them were still very much tucked inside of their beds, like they had nowhere to be. And this upset her. She wakes them up. She tells them that they just can't do whatever they want to do. Like there are rules. And among those rules, like school is the most important. You cannot skip school. You don't have the option of not going to school. So she tells them to get up right away and get dressed because shy you're going. The two of them, they get up, they immediately begin getting dressed for school. And once they're done, they're gonna join her in the kitchen so that she can take them. She is still very much upset. She is still fussing and going on about the importance of school and how they don't wanna follow the rules and how that's not acceptable. Then all of a sudden, she grabs a hot pot from the stove and threatens them with it. They attempt to just take the pot from her hands and then from there an all-out brawl just ensues between the three of them. According to them, once they got the pot from her, she then picks up a kitchen knife and threatens them with it. She's like, get back, I'll use it, y'all back up, and they do. Now, once they back up a bit, she puts the knife down and then they begin fighting again. They go from fighting inside of the kitchen to now fighting in the living room. And from there, things only become more intense. Jazz picks up a vase and breaks it over Nikki's head. Nikki then lunges at her. Meanwhile, Taz goes to the kitchen and grabs the pot that Nikki had initially picked up and returns to the living room and begins hitting Nikki over the head with it. Now, at this point, they're both fighting Nikki and she is putting her all into defending herself against these two girls. That's why all of the scratches and the bite marks come in because she is trying to fight the two of them off by any means necessary and then Taz has breaks away from the fight like suddenly just all of a sudden walks away however she returns with the kitchen knife and plunges it into Nikki now you know those ribbon like medallions you win for like spelling bees or honor roll and things like that in elementary school well jazz she is not stunned or shocked by the the stab at all she does not even skip a beat she goes and gets one of these ribbon medallions puts it around nikki's neck and begins to choke her out of nowhere nikki musters up enough strength to knock the hell out of her she hits Jazz so hard, Jazz backs up off of her. And Jazz was actually stunned by this. Like she was stunned like, wait a minute, child, you hit me a little hard. But in the same breath, she becomes completely enraged. Like this pisses her off. From there, she just completely blacks out. She then snatches the knife from Taz and she just goes like in a full on rage. Afterward, the two of them together drag Nikki into the bathroom. She is still alive. At this point, according to them, with her last breaths, she is telling them how much she hates them, that they're going to jail, that they're never getting away with this. She hates them so much. And during all of this, they're actually apologizing to her, telling her that they're sorry, not only for what is transferring like in this moment and this day, but the fact that things have become so bad between them, like they were just so sorry about it. And then they just literally sit there with her and they sit and just wait for her to die. Like literally take her final breath. At the point in which she does, they don't know what to do. They don't know what their next move should be. They disagree on it. They actually do have a little bit of argument about it, a disagreement about it. They didn't fight each other and get to bite each other like they claimed the girl. It was just like, oh, we should do this. No, we shouldn't call the police. Like they're not believe us. They go and they attempt to clean up a little bit just to buy some time and try to, you know, figure things out, figure out what their next move should be. And then one of them comes up with the idea that maybe they should leave things as they are. Maybe they should let it look as though there was an intruder who broke in, maybe wanted to rob the place, found Nikki there, and things got a little out of hand. Meanwhile, they were in school the whole time. So they go to stage the crime scene just a little bit to make it look as though, yes, yeah, someone did break in. It was in fact an intruder here. And then they leave the house and go to school as if nothing happened. They grab Nikki's purse, they grab Nikki's cell phone and the weapon, put it all in a trash bag, which they then decided that they will go discard somewhere, like just trash somewhere. And then they head off to school to establish their alibi. Now, in their mind, what they expected to happen was they would return home and it would be like on the movies where you come home, you don't know a tragedy has struck your house. You see like police officers, spectators in the streets, caution tape and all of the things. And you're like, I live here. And the police are like, no, you can't go in. And they're like, no, I, li like, I live here. Like, let me in. They expected that to be going on. 
But when they return home from school, there is nothing. There are no police officers, no caution tape, none of the things. All that was there was the horrific reality of what they had done. When they realize that they now have to make the next move, they decide that there really isn't anything else to do but call the police, which is something now in their confession they claim that they wish that they had done when Nikki allegedly picked up the pot and threatened them. They claim that they wish they had just called the police then. In January of 2014, Tasmia pleads guilty to voluntary manslaughter and receives a 30-year prison sentence. The following month, her sister, Jasmine, she enters her guilty plea to the same exact charges and receives her little twin sentence of 30 years. The twins were also ordered to remain in two separate prisons, period. Like, girl, y'all will never have each other to hold at night. The girls were first eligible for parole in 2017, but child, they are denied parole instantaneously. Now, if they serve out their entire sentences, they will be 51 years old when they are released from prison in 2044. And child, why when I was trying to calculate like how old they'd be, I tried to calculate the ages separately as if they and twins born on the same day at the same damn time. I don't know what goes on with me sometimes. And I just know that y'all did not think I was gonna let y'all get out of here without me telling y'all they zodiac signs. Born on November 27th, 1993, they are Sagittarius's both of them and when i go and do my little tally up because i'm in the process of tallying up like all of the zodiac signs that i've done especially because a lot of people are under the impression that you know their sign is not ever talked about we have covered every last single sign everyone has had a turn and the sagittarius is they are among those few signs that i always like it ain't never it ain't never one of us it's never one of my people well today girl it's two of them and they will be counted twice and before you get down in my comment section talk about that's not really fair i don't really care so both of them will go on the list separately as they should because if these were siblings just regular old siblings child nothing special about them born on two different days under two different signs they will both count individually now let's talk a little bit about my business okay you already know i made it to houston and i've been here for a couple of weeks now so first i'm gonna start with the last couple of weeks in my old apartment child i spent the last couple of weeks in my old apartment stockpiling videos and trying to move and just get all of my business in order and things set up here for whatever reason i guess i thought i was a superhero and that i could stockpile all of these videos for the whole rest of june and the whole month of july it was really unrealistic i also have other things that i'm working on that is just taking so much of my time but i'm excited about it and i'm having fun but it's just like girl anyway i was so ready to leave and just get here to houston all of a sudden child i don't know what happened it was like a switch went off and i went into it just an extreme low like an extreme horrible low and I told myself that once I move everything is gonna be okay like the only reason I'm feeling this bad is because I'm just doing so much so I need to just take a step back focus on the move and once I complete this stressful situation or process like I'll just be perfectly fine and perfectly happy so I decided to take a break things definitely became a lot worse just a lot worse I literally spent the last two weeks in my apartment it's just so emotional and just Distraught job. And at the same time, I felt like time was just going by so slow. And I finally get here. I'm unpacking all of the packages that were already here that had arrived that I ordered beforehand. And then I go to hit the stores and I'm buying all of these little cute little pieces of decor and the things that I need for my home. And I'm enjoying Houston, girl, eating all of the food. But anyway, I'm enjoying Houston. I'm seeing my sister. Like, I'm just having a ball. This is where the story gets a little, you know, I don't know what to call it. It gets it's a little cray. My new bed delivers and I'm just like, girl, you got to get your life together. You have to empty out all of these boxes. I got tired of going through a maze of boxes that I had not unpacked from my previous apartment. So I finally decide, you know what? Everything is getting unpacked and put away. I do that. I go to bed that night and I'm feeling good and I'm just proud of myself and I'm like, yes, ma'am. Now, you know, in the movies where you have a nightmare and you just wake up out of your sleep like you just sit straight up and you looking like like what the hell girl i'm sleeping in my bed minding my business and now all of a sudden like i wasn't even dreaming but all of a sudden i have this dream and it's like i'm laying in my bed which i'm always shocked when i have nightmares or dreams and like i'm in the actual real apartment because girl when i have a dream and i'm in it i'm always somewhere i don't even recognize like it's always some random place but this was like my actual little new apartment and i'm in my 
no little bit, just minding my business. I open my eyes, this is still the dream, like I'm sure I was dreaming. I open my eyes and there is this huge demonic presence, like right, comes right in my face, stops and says, new bed, same nightmare. So I jump up out of my sleep and I'm like, look at damn bed, you didn't have to do me like this. Like, girl, what's going on? But I didn't think nothing of it. I just thought it was a little ugly little nightmare that just came through and just tried to mess up my night. And I go back to sleep, wake up the next morning and I don't want to get out of bed. I am feeling like I was feeling in the last two weeks at my previous apartment. And I'm just so sad again. And then this time it's really bad because at first I was just like, oh, this is the why and this is what I have to look forward to to get over the hump like everything will be fine but now I don't have anything to look forward to I'm just like this is what I thought was going to cure that like this was supposed to make me feel good this is what's supposed to bring me this happiness this peace this joy I'm not supposed to feel like this right now and so this was actually worse than the last two weeks of my other apartment. I would not get out of bed, girl. And the thing is, I'm not even a DoorDash type of girl because I be feeling like, I be scared that the DoorDasher that I get is gonna be somebody who like sticks their finger all in their mouth, do all of this and then swirl it around in my drink of my food. And I get it, I'll never know until, you know, I'm just standing at the pearly gates, girl, waiting on them to double check and make sure that I'm not on the list, girl, and that I don't have reservations up here before they send me down to the high place. I got to the point where I didn't even wanna leave my home, so I really didn't have a choice, girl, because I couldn't just stay here and be hungry and, you know, starve. I was door dashing food to my house. I would go like check my mail and do like minimal things. Walk Blue downstairs, I would take him down to the dog area. And this goes on for days. But one of those Tuesdays, I ordered a bunch of tacos, girl, and I had some tequila. It was the saddest party you ever would have seen, girl. Imagine a, a sad clown having a damn party. That was me that day. So anyway, this is the type of person that I am. I could be going through my own thing, but certain things, like certain common courtesy, certain etiquette that I was just, that I just feel like is right, that I was taught. I'm the type of person that I could be going through whatever, but when I go out into the world, I'm not going to intentionally like transfer that negative energy to anybody else. It's not anybody else's fault. I feel like once you leave your house, girl, you need to leave all of that mess there. So I will get on the elevator. Somebody got on, or if somebody was there, I would say good morning. And they were just like real stank. I would take Blue down to the dog park, and if somebody was there in the dog area, like I would speak, and they would just be like, hey. And then not long after, they would take the little dog and leave. It was just like real rude. And I would be completely honest. All of the people that I had encountered up until this point were, you know, my vanilla bean brethren and so i felt like they was kind of giving me go back to africa girl like that's just in my mind that's what i that's what i thought it was honestly but then i started encountering the black people and they were worse this one girl she gets on the elevator and mind you i'm going down to the mail room which is on the bottom floor like it's on the it's in the lobby i'm already on the elevator and i've already hit the button for the lobby it's already lit up she gets on the elevator off her floor i said good morning and she was like good morning and then she hits the one again like girl it's already lit up and i know you see it so i took that as kind of like hurry up and get me off of here like girl come on close the door girl because i don't want to be on here with this girl it pissed me off it was just like why do you have to be such a bitch like you just don't you're just choosing to be an asshole at this point point. and that wasn't even the worst interaction i was in the dog park one day and I go into the dog area and there is this tall beautiful girl like she looks like a butterscotch goddess okay beautiful she has a beautiful giant poodle like beautiful poodle you know how a dog and their person not look alike but like look like the perfect pair like they just look like they go together like together they look like a barbie and like her little toy dog like they were like perfectly matched they both looked beautiful child separately and together i enter the dog area she looks at me i speak she does not Part her lips to reply. I'm like, well, goddamn, bitch, am I invisible? Can you not hear? Her dog runs over to me and she's like, Coco. And I'm like, well, damn, if you can Coco, you can definitely hear. And furthermore, you were looking right at me when I spoke. You just didn't want to speak back for whatever reason. Now, here I am, still just trying to be a nice human being with a soul. She comes over to me because she's coming to get her dog. When she gets to me, I'm like, your dog is beautiful. You think she part her lips to say thank you or any of the things? Girl, nothing. When I say nothing came out of her mouth, nothing job. I remember thinking, I'm about to beat this bitch up. At that point, I said, you know what? I'm not speaking to nobody else. 
it's definitely not like a color thing it's just everybody in my building is an asshole and what i didn't get like literally everywhere that i had been the people were so nice so i'm like this is not a texas people thing like it's just the people that live in my building are assholes it's just it's it's weird like how did everybody end up here now this also really pissed me off and upset me because my apartment complex they do social gatherings like maybe one or two a month and I knew this beforehand and so I really looked forward to this like you know socializing with my neighbors fellowshipping and so it really irritated me because I'm just like these people are assholes the event is posted and I'm like I'm not even gonna go because they're jerks like why would I want to go and be around a bunch of rude ass people like what are we gonna do just look at each other all stank and refuse to talk to one another or did y'all have like a meeting and y'all just hate me in blue like I don't understand what's going on so I decided you know what I'm not going and then I felt like they took that from me like I'm like damn y'all done robbed me of my social experiment and I got an attitude about it so I was like I'm not speaking to nobody else like if somebody speaks to me first I'll speak back because I'm not a jerk but I'm not making the effort so I'm going through all of this too while I'm in my my slumber so I'm laying in bed one day and something I was watching on YouTube it brought up the subject of like saging a home or whatever and the light bulb came on and I say you know what because you know with my Native American background girl and I be trying to be connected to all parts of me I am very much familiar with the process of saging why you sage how you do it and you know the difference that it does make typically I sage on New Year's now I know I'm supposed to sage a lot more frequently than that but we ain't gonna talk about that we ain't gonna tell my ancestors child because this is very ignorant. I'm going to go ahead and acknowledge that for all of you girls who are for me with saging. Because I was going to be the first occupant of my unit. Like nobody's ever lived in this apartment before me. I didn't feel an urgency about saging. Because I'm just like, there's nobody's bad energy probably to get rid of here. I didn't feel an extreme urgency to sage the apartment. So I had not done it. And it definitely was not something that I had on my mind. And then I thought about it like, the light bulb came on and I'm like, it's not a coincidence that the moment in which I unpack all of my things from the last apartment and go to sleep, like have that nightmare, that, that whole dream thing. And that's the exact moment that I begin to feel the exact same way. Like when I took all of that stuff out of boxes, I feel like my negative bad energy was attached to all of that stuff. And once I opened up all the boxes and put all of the things around my space, like I just filled my space with negative, nasty, bad energy. And so I decide that I'm going to go down to a spiritual shop and purchase some sage so I can just cleanse because of course it's never too late. I go into the spiritual shop. And you know, they sell like all of the cute little witchy vibe things. I get to the register and I'm checking out and the girl at the counter, she is just so nice. And she's like, is your name by chance? And in my mind, after by chance, I'm like, oh shit. Like if she says my name, she probably got like a gift or she probably know magic. Like what else do you see, girl? And she says, Brittany. And I'm like, in my mind, like in my soul, I'm just like, she does have a gift. It's like she's psychic. So I'm like, yes. And she goes, I watch you on YouTube. And I was like, I really, I really thought Miss Mama was like Miss Cleo in that thing. But anyway, if you're watching the video, girl, shout out to you and all of the ladies in the shop. Their skin was so immaculate. I'm like, well, goddamn, do I need to stick around for a minute, girl? Like, all of y'all's skin looks, looks like various shades of porcelain. But back to the story. So I go home, I sage. So because all I had done for like the past four or five days is like lay in my bed. Once I open up my windows and the door, I'm just like, I'm just gonna lay down. But like after laying there for like 30 minutes, all of a sudden I had energy, like I wanted to get up and do things. I felt more like me, like I felt like happy, normal me, not sad ass me. But not only that, something else that I noticed that shifted, and this was the craziest part of it all to me. Y'all, I kid you not, I swear to you. I take blue down to the dog park. Mind you, I told y'all I'm already on guard. I'm just already decided in my spirit that I'm not giving no more even still like i was in a better mood but i was just already like you know i'm just not expecting anything from these people there's a guy he's moving in but he has movers bringing all of his things in and he is standing outside like right outside the dog park watching his movers and when i come into the dog park he speaks and i'm like who me like you must not have attended your first we hate britney and blue meeting you must not know that these girls hate us. So I speak back and I'm like, hi. And then he's like, oh my God, your dog is beautiful. Do you mind if I come in and play with him? I don't mind, that's fine. Blue loves, Blue loves people. He gets so happy when people speak to him. Like he just loves 
human attention. So knowing that'll literally make his whole day, I'm like, sure. He comes in, he gets down on the ground, he is playing with Blue, Blue's having the time of his life. And he's just talking to both of us. He's just like, oh, he's so beautiful. You know, what's his name? Asking me just questions we're talking about, like dog feeding, and all of the things. And I'm just like, nope, he ain't had his orientation yet where they get to the part where everybody hates us. He plays a Blue for a while and then he goes off handles his business and when I tell you everybody from that point on has been so nice I pass people in the hallway they're like good morning I'm in the dog area of blue and people are like walking by with their dogs and they're like hi and they come into the dog park girl they let the dog play with blue and then they're like okay have a good day you have a great day like people get on the elevator and they're so nice and I'm just like Am I in the fucking twilight zone? Like, what's going on? It made no sense. But I'm just like, was my bad energy, like, attracting other people with bad energy? Or were they, like, feeling my bad energy and it caused them to react the way that they did? I don't know. It was just weird to me. And these are not the same people. I have yet to see the same person twice, which I also think is kind of weird. I definitely, honestly, think it's a little strange that I don't see the same person twice. Not really, I guess, considering the layout, but it's still a little strange. Like, nobody... I really like this hair. Like it's very much given Beyonce's cousin on Tina's side. Not on not on Matthew Knows' side. On Tina's side. No shade to the people on Knows side. I'm just saying. Did I tell y'all the story when I um ran into Tina Knows in New Orleans? Child, I probably did tell the story. I don't know. But that woman is freaking beautiful. Like I feel like she had the Medusa effect where she just looked you in your eyes and turned into stone. Because at the point in which she locked eyes with me, I couldn't even respond to her greeting with a normal human response. I just froze and said, "You make Beyonce." And that's literally all i could come up with she was literally that stunning i'm super excited to get back into the habits like of filming for a minute i thought i had lost my mojo i was really questioning myself like second guessing myself and feeling like what if i can't do it what if i, was, I suck at this what if i've lost my mojo and then of course because my last video did not perform that well. The Carl Panzerin video, which I thought was such an interesting story, but it did not perform that well. And if you know anything about YouTube Studio, child, you know you log in and it compares your last 10 videos. And every time I log in, I was just seeing it like, this video is rated number 10 out of your last 10 uploads. And I'm just like, girl, you must remind me that my video is flopping. I was honestly already feeling like, stressed but that was the point in which i started to feel like sad when i saw the video wasn't performing and i'm just like how y'all what is going on and i'm working so hard to put these videos out before are they even interested in me anymore i really just spiraled child and even when i got ready to film i'm just like are they even gonna watch it like do people even still care just crazy and dramatic that's all don't don't mind me don't mind me at all but thank you to everybody who sent out well wishes. I love you guys so much. I appreciate your support so much. I'm so happy to be back. I will not hold you any longer. I appreciate you so much for watching, especially if you got to this point. As always, I love you so much. I appreciate you spending your time with me, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Peace. What is up, my beauty up there? I ain't done this in a minute. Take a little sip of water, child. Sixteen-year-old twins, Jasmine and what the fuck was her name? It's not Jasmine. And whatever money, money. They were not here for any of her tight discipline ship. Is the discipline ship a word? I think it is. Whatever. If it's not, we just go ahead and edit that out. Whatever. In late December of two thousand and nine. Take off the damn jet. Okay, they they weren't like that. I would have been like that. And with all of the evidence, the prosecution actually accepts. I can't talk. The prosecution actually upsets, upsets. What am I talking about? And then they head off to school to establish their prayer. All that was there was the horrific reality of her girl.